Cody yeah. went right off into the sunset. You're sitting here picking up the pieces. We gotta get you into work, man. Just like Rocky. I think so. Yeah, we talked about that two weeks ago. Remember me going through the streets of Greenbush? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. said, "Hey, yo, Adrian, I did it." Yeah. Isn't there just one street up there? Yeah. Oh, we got many, but you know. So he's taking an alley. We just go up to the school and we just climb the stairway, and then we do that little uh, uh, yeah. stance in the air that he does or whatever. So. Yeah, they're gonna have a statue of you. Yeah, a, a, a shot. <laughs> And Sean yeah, runs, yeah. runs through the streets of Greenbush. <laughs> That'd be the next thing. Boy, I tell you, I can picture that. Too. With a flip cam in my hand, the YouTube hat, or U- yeah, YouTube hat in my hand. Well, you don't need a YouTube hat. You'd be like Rocky. Just go wear some, <laughs> or a hoodie. some, some bare bones Jones stuff. No name stuff. <laughs> oh, wow. He's dancing down there. <laughs> He's got his little leg warmers on. <laughs> Running down the streets. I feel Greenbush. like boxing for some reason. I don't know why, but... Uh crazy. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the next thing. You want your name back, you gotta box somebody. Oh, great. Do you have to box you? Oh, no, goodness. I'm not gonna get hurt. Sugar Sean Slauson's gonna be boxing to be uh, determined uh, the name of the opponent. get a cordless mic and throw it outside. And, and if I had to yeah. box a blind dog, that would be fair, because, you know, it's just, you know, just Oh, man, dog. I... <laughs> I can open an our family size can of whoop ass. Oh goodness, our family. All right, guys, we're gonna get to some a couple tunes here, and then I'm gonna try to get a hold of our interview guest tonight. Hopefully, he's home. Uh, Peter Richmond. Well, we don't know Peter if I gave me a bunk number. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Like I, I got you. I would be crushed. Number to the payphone down the street. Oh. <laughs> Let it ring 22 times. Yeah, and then we'll pick up. Then try again. Don't get antsy on the 18th. I'm going to answer it on the 21st. <laughs> All right, we've got some new stuff from Bad Religion, also new stuff from Kate coming up. This is Bad Religion. From- now broadcasting in HD Digital. This is Roots Radio, Pioneer 90.1, KSRQ, Thief River Falls, Grand Forks. 90.1 FM, KSRQ, Tuesday Night Experiment. We have a guest on the phone. He is the author of an excellent book I had the chance to uh, read here uh, last month called Badasses, The Legend of Snake, Fu, Dr. Death, and John Madden's Oakland Raiders. I may be a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, but I definitely have much love and appreciation for the old school Oakland Raiders, and with us today is the author of this amazing book, Mr. Peter Richmond. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, man. It's a great, great book that you put out here. Uh, we definitely, at this time of year especially, we, we think a lot about the football season, but it's great that you uh, captured a, a great moment in time for such a storied franchise, in a franchise that is not your ordinary, average, all-American, uh, ma, pa, and apple pie <laughs> sort of team. We're talking about renegades, rebels, but mostly great players. That's the deal they, with the Oakland Raiders. You're right. Um, they were anti-mom and pop and apple pie, and as a Steeler fan, you know what they played like. They were a great football team. I mean, the important thing, I wouldn't have written the book just because they were you know, rebels and renegades and, and, and lovable outlaws if they hadn't been good. Um, the whole key was the book works because they did manage to claw their way through several conference championships in the 70s and finally win a Super Bowl dominating in the sem- in 76. Your Steelers won two Super Bowl rings that decade and so did the Dolphins and mm-hmm. so did the Cowboys. But the best team in the 70s, the team that nobody wanted to play, was the Raiders. So I loved them because they were outlaws and so was I. And when I was in college, you know, I was a rebel without a cause and I loved the NFL and I kind of adopted this team that, you know, with the with the crazy long hair and the afros and the goatees and the eye black and the Al Davis and John Madden were just kind of like, hey, you can be a rebel and play football. I like this team. So I decided to write about the last team that I thought were badasses, played the game for fun and not for money. And they're very uh, – want to talk about a, a team with a great work ethic. A lot of people, uh, you know, they talk about the rebel thing, but something that gets lost in the translation is these are a lot of these guys would do the extra a- after practice sort of thing. These guys worked together in tandem, and they worked really well together, but they also worked really hard. I mean, they were hard partiers, but they were also hard workers. The reason Madden let them be hard partiers was because they would come out, and this this is not – apocryphal this is real they'd practice and then madden would say end of practice and nobody would go in they'd all break off and do extra work for another hour or so they just did the guys who'd show up at the team from other teams you know would, would go in at the end of practice and then madden would say where do you think you're going look turn around look at your teammates 
And there'd be Bolitnikoff and Stabler doing 50 more passes. There'd be, you know, Tatum working with uh, Atkinson on their footwork. There'd be Willie Brown telling uh, Matusak that he's, he's like, jumping too early on, on the count. And they do all this extra work, and it's because they loved each other, and they loved to play the game. And that's what drew me to the team. That's why I wanted to write about it, is it was obvious that they loved the game, and they loved their teammates. They used to come to practice early. They used to come to spring training, uh, summer training, early. They lie to their wives <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> of training camp. Honey, when's training camp start? Um, uh, June 28th. Oh, it's early this year. Yeah. And then they'd go off and they'd get there early so they could just hang with their buddies. Because before free agency, you'd be with a team for eight or ten years, and they all got to love each other. And, and it was like it was like this boys' club, this, this adult summer camp during the summer. And it was two months long. They played six exhibition games. They would just work their butts off for the fun of the game. And then Madden would say, okay, you've done your work. Go whatever you have to do. No curfew. I'm not going to check. You're men. You're professionals. Be here in the morning and work your butt off. And they loved him so much for giving him so much space that they go out on Sundays and say, we better not let this dude down. Or Al Davis, who they also loved. So it was kind of the last time that football worked the way we loved football. You know, before the free agency and the money took over, before Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night games, before players started playing for themselves mm -hmm. instead of their teams. It was the last team when football was just really played for all the right reasons. Plus, as you said at the beginning, and you're right, man for man, the 76 Raiders were an unbelievable football team. And of course, you, the Steelers wouldn't say so. Well, no, no, hey, hey, I, 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 I'll give, like I said, I'm giving credit where credit is due because <laughs> these teams, like you said, in, before this whole independent contractor free agency uh, exactly. boom, you had teams that established a wonderful rapport with each other, and that on the field was an excellent dynamic, and that's a winning formula. Look at Madden's record. I mean, Madden didn't necessarily coach uh, too long in the league, but he went out when he, you know, when it was right. But you look at those teams that he coached, talk about a winning percentage. Well, he had the highest winning percentage in the history of football when he checked out. He was above Lombardi. And he did what, what I admired about it was when I was a little kid, I had, even though I was a Giant fan, I had Jimmy Brown's poster on my wall because Jim Brown of the Cleveland Browns to me was like the greatest thing ever. Brown walked out at the top, and everybody said, how can you leave when you're like the best football player? And he knew, and I've interviewed him several times, Brown knew that it would never get any better. He'd won a championship. He was acknowledged as being the best running back in history. And after nine years, he said to himself, if I keep doing this, it's just not going to be any better than it's been. It'll probably just get worse. And he had movie offers, so he left. Yes. So Madden, after 10 years had gotten 103 wins after 10 years, the fastest guy to hit 100 in history. He had a better winning percentage than Lombardi. And when he won that 76 Super Bowl, after six years in the conference championship and losing, when he won that 76 Super Bowl, he doesn't even remember the locker room. I asked him to like piece together what happened after it was over. He can't remember. He said, I might have floated into the shower with my clothes on. I don't know. I just don't remember. It was the greatest moment of my life. And I said, now, and now what? He's like 76. And I said, now, that's still the greatest moment in your life? And he said, absolutely. So he said to himself, wait a minute. It's never going to be this good again. The next year, Rob Lytle's fumble controversy, they didn't make the Super Bowl again. And the year after that, he said, wait a minute. Get out. You're at the top. You've got the best winning percentage in the history of coaching. Just go find something else. He left without even knowing he was going to you know, become what he's become. Mm -hmm. He just left. And then he got into a commercial where he was really good. And then he got cast as, as a football commentator where he was really good. And he went on to be you know, the greatest commentator, this guy we love. But the fact is, and he knows this, he loves to talk about this. It's why he wanted to talk to me about this 76 team. He was a great Coach, and he should be in the. I, I think he's up there with Lombardi and Shula and and, and Paul Brown and George Hallis. I really think he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we talked about uh, you know some of the play. Well, we haven't really gotten a chance actually to talk about some of the, the players <laughs> that were on the team. This must have yes, been fun doing should. the research uh, yeah. uh, and doing these interviews with a lot of these legendary figures like touch. You know, Freddie Bolitnikoff. What a receiver, man! The, I think the guy was uh, sixty percent stick him towards the end.